So a lot of times you have data that occurs in pairs, age and height. That's something that I took care of when my kids were growing up. I watched how old they were versus how high they were. I wanted to make sure that they were the right height for their age. And you can look at percentiles. We'll talk about those in a little bit, maybe in section chapter three. You can look at height versus weight. You wanna make sure that there's a good balance that you're not too short for your weight or vice versa. In fact, with height and weight, you can calculate something called BMI. Does anyone know what BMI is? Yes, body mass index. index. Good, your body mass index. And it's kind of a very crude one dimensional way of looking at if you're overweight or not. I mean, it's not perfect, certainly that there's more to it than just that, but you know, it depends on your height and your weight. Turning over to economics, you could look at the prime rate of interest versus the federal funds rate, which is the rate that banks charge each other for overnight loans. You could look at something again, back in the, the biometrics field, number of cigarettes smoked per day versus your chance of lung cancer, et cetera. All these things have one thing in common, and that is they're looking at, you're looking at data in X, Y pairs, pairs of data. Now, when you think X, Y, what do you think of? Think of graphs. And not just any graph, but in statistics, we'll call these graphs scatter plots. Looks, sometimes it looks like the pattern that you'd expect when you shoot a shotgun at a target. All right, it's just a, a bunch of dots. So let's take a look at some scatter plots and try and understand how to, to create a scatter plot. Andrew Yang, 60 seconds. Uh, Point is, What's next? Where's automation um, leading to next? Thank you. Didn't want that one there. Let's see. So let's go to stat disk. And let me see if I can't give you some data. Go back here and see what data I've got. I think this might be the actresses and actors data. So if you want to get this data set, then what you can do is click data and then data sets. Excuse me, let's just click data sets, go down to LRM, elementary statistics, 13th edition, and scroll down to category number 14, Oscar winner age. So bam, there you go. And that should, put a lot of nice data in your data set. In fact, I remember there should be 87 rows to this data set, and there are. The nice things about using StatDisk is that once your data is in here, we can easily manipulate it. So I'll give people a chance to make sure that they've got the data set. One more time, you're gonna click data sets, elementary statistics, and scroll down to data set number 14, Oscar winner age should give you this. Now, what I'd be curious to see is, is there a relationship between the age that the actress wins the Oscar for best actress and the same thing for the actor in the same year? So let's plot those. Click data. Not data sets this time, but data. Scroll down to scatter plot. And it's going to ask you, well, what do you want to plot? Well, I guess it depends on how you view the data. Do you think that the age of the actress predicts the age of the actor or vice versa? I guess it depends on what you think. So I'll put the age of the actress on the x axis and the age of the actor on the y-axis. And then you can label them. Now it's already suggested some labels. I think we'll go with those. We can give it a title, Oscar 
Yeah, might help if I can type Oscar winners. I'm going to shut off this regression line here for the moment. When you're ready, you can plot this. And it doesn't look like too much, does it? Just looks kind of random. Doesn't look like there's any big pattern to this data at all. That's okay. That's sometimes going to happen when you work with data. There might not be a pattern. So is everyone able to follow me this far and, and get this plot? Yes. Thank you. So anyone that's struggling a little bit and like, ah, I, I just, I can't find that. I can't get that. All right. Um, well, let's take a look at what it's going to be like for you to get some data out of the homework. And give me a second here if I can't see if I can't find some data for us in the homework. So I kind of have a question on like how you're supposed to figure out like, cause it's just blue dots everywhere. Like right. how, how are you supposed to make sense of that? Well, that's a great question. And there's, there's a couple things we're gonna look at one of them is we're gonna look and see if the, the data can be summarized by a line. And independent of that, we'll also calculate something called the linear correlation coefficient. So linear correlation coefficient is gonna help us decide to what degree there's a linear relationship between the variables. So perhaps let me change up a little bit and We'll look at the linear correlation coefficient first. So I'm going to dump a file in the chat. It's basically going to be this handout on the linear correlation coefficient. I'm also going to give you a chance to try and play with that if you'd like. So let me first dump that file into the chat, the linear correlation coefficient. And it should be there, should be able to find that. While you open that up, let me see if I can't open up. Uh, okay, sorry about that part. Um, oops. So, there's a nice little applet that you're going to run into as part of your homework. It's one of the questions in section 2.4. It's going to ask you to kind of watch a video. Now, one of the things that will be in this video is an explanation of how you actually calculate the linear correlation coefficient. You can pretty much ignore that because we're not going to calculate that by hand. It's just not something that I'm gonna ask that you do. But let me see if I can't get you to open up this chat or this link that I'll put in the chat, which should take you to the linear correlation coefficient. Is this also like, can it be found on D2L? No, not this link, but you'll, you'll run into this link as part of your homework. Okay. So, so you will get to play with it there if it's if it's not opening up for you now. And I think I'm going to have to skip through a little bit of this. Sets the so linear co the so linear the correlation coefficient r is, is bound to values between mm -hmm. one and negative one. The table to the right shows the relationship between r and a data set s correlation. Use the slider to vary the value of r. The graph illustrates what a scatter plot of such an R value might look like. Okay, so you are gonna have to wade through a little bit of stuff from this just to kind of view it and go through it. But the end result is this little applet, which I think is really cool. 
So I'm not sure if you're able to get this open or not. If you are, great. If not, it's not a big deal. If you're not, you can kind of turn to the handout. And let me explain what's going on in the handout. So we've got this linear correlation coefficient, which is called R, or it's represented by R. And its extreme values are negative one to one. So what does that mean? Well, let's talk about it. So the linear correlation coefficient, negative one is less than or equal to R is less than or equal to one. This measures the strength of a linear relationship. And what you're going to want to keep an eye on is a couple of these extremes. For instance, negative one, one, and zero. So let's look at some of these extremes here and understand what some of these extremes mean. I'll give you a second to copy that down. Can you move your sheet up a little bit? Yeah. Um, does that help? Is that, yeah. is that camera stuff? Is that appearing on your? Yeah. It is? Oh, I'm sorry about that. I'm not sure why it's doing it today. Uh, there we go. That got rid of it. All right, so let's take a look at a correlation or yeah, linear correlation of R equals one. So that's back onto your handout. And when you do a scatter plot and get a linear correlation of one, what that's gonna mean is that all your data is in a line and it's got a nice positive slope there. So that's what you would expect from R equals one. All right, my one note here is, is kind of giving me trouble. So there's, there's R equals one. All the data is on that one line. Now it's not very often that you're gonna find a perfect linear correlation. It's not often you're gonna find R equals one. More likely you're to find something like this where the data suggests a trend, it's a positive relationship, but it's not perfectly one. Maybe it's something close to one, like 0.86. Okay. Now let's remind ourselves the name of R. The name of R is the linear correlation coefficient. So it's talking about the degree to which there's a linear relationship. So when we look back at our chart here, R equals zero. Well, yeah, R equals zero here. Yeah, I get it, but doesn't it look like there's a relationship there between X and Y? What do you think? Does it look like there's a relationship there between X and Y? Yeah, it could be like a quadratic relationship. Yeah, oh, well done. It's a quadratic relationship for sure. So the problem is we're looking at the linear relationship. R measures the linear correlation coefficient. So it's not gonna pick up those quadratic relationships, which is why you're gonna get R equal to zero. Here's another more typical representation of something you're gonna see, which is close to zero. That scatter plot where everything just looks like a shotgun blast. It's just all random. Now, as you move towards a negative one, your data is gonna be close to a line, not perfect, but that line, that imaginary line you're gonna have is gonna have a negative slope. So that would be a negative linear correlation that as you increase one, you decrease the other. And finally, you get to R equals negative one itself, which is a perfect negative linear correlation. 
Now, if you're able to get that link open, that was great. If not, it's no big deal. Here's what happens. It's just kind of a nice interactive way to get familiar with the different values of R. We start out at negative one and you move this slider and you can see what happens. It kind of devolves away from negative one. It's gonna approach zero, which looks like it's completely random. And then at, as we move past zero to a positive relationship and you're closer to one, the data is getting closer and closer to a perfect straight line. And then at that perfect straight line, you can see up here in the right that the correlation is exactly one, the linear correlation. So, so those are kind of the extremes that you're gonna see. Now, kind of a heads up for you, one of the things that I've learned that I can do is ask my own questions. And one of the things that I might reasonably do would be give you a data set. And let me just draw kind of a quick example for us right here. So just uh, you know, a few points and then give you a few choices for R. So negative one, That would be a nice reasonable way to ask you, do you really understand R? Because there's no calculation. And if you can think about it carefully, you should probably be able to pick out which one you like. Now, let's do it this way. Let's eliminate the ones that it just can't be. Without thinking too much, uh, was it Frodet? Did I pronounce that right? Yeah. Okay, for that, without thinking too much, eliminate two of these for me, just right off the bat. It's like, no, it can't be these. Um, the negative 0 0.03. Okay. Or we could just go with the one and the negative one, those two, because <laughs> it's not okay. a straight linear line. Okay. So. Um, how about we eliminate these two right off the bat? Why can I eliminate those two without thinking too much? Because they're, they're positive. Because they're positive. positive. Yeah, that, that would mean that the day would be up and to the right. But they're certainly not positive. And for that, why did you eliminate this one? Because it is the least closest to a line. And what we have is close to a line. Yeah. So this would imply data is random. It wouldn't be close to a line at all. So you can eliminate that one. Cool. I need somebody else to eliminate one more for us. Negative one. Negative one. Thanks, Reagan. Why can we eliminate negative one? Because it's not perfect. Exactly. Thank you, Samuel. Because it's not a perfect straight line. It's close to that straight line, but it's not a perfect straight line. So yeah, you can eliminate that one and bingo. There's a quick three points. Okay. Uh, let's practice getting some data into StatDisk. Um, I have a quick question. Yeah, please. Yeah, it's not about specifically, but um, when you showed the examples of like all the graphs and the one that was R equals zero was like that parabola shape, but when you were doing it on the slider on the website, um, uh, yeah, R equals zero, it's like the yeah. parabola. It showed, on the website, it, when you passed by zero, it looked like totally random. So, um, is it? Yeah, so on the website, it showed more of this kind of a case. It didn't yeah. show this one. But both of these, you know, can have a correlation of zero. If this was a little bit more random, it would have a correlation of zero. And the reason that, you know, it's just the way that the website were programmed. They didn't show something like this but it could have, 
this has a correlation of zero, not because it's random, but because this is a quadratic relationship or something other than a linear relationship. So there's no linear part to it. It's just perhaps a quadratic part. So that's why uh, this has a correlation of zero, even though it looks like it has a pattern here. So does that help? Yeah, yeah. Okay, appreciate the question. Um, but uh, let, me, let me follow up on his question a little bit there, Sam. There is a relationship here, right? And we kind of want to say something about that. There, there's like, gosh, there's something going on here. So, so what can we say? And well, what's going on is that there's something more to consider beyond just correlation. So let's talk about correlation versus causation. Now we're gonna briefly go over this now. Later on in the course, we're gonna spend you know, a good half of a lecture talking about causation, how to define causation, not necessarily how to define it, but how to prove causation. And I should put prove in quotes because actually proving something is left for a math class, maybe a class in logic. But if there's a correlation between two things, then that means there's a relationship or pattern. Relationship or pattern. And certainly with that graph that you're referencing, Sam, we did see a pattern. And it's like, well, wait a minute, there should be something there. The unfortunate part for us is that it wasn't a linear correlation. But there are things we can do, and we'll see some of that later on. On the other hand, there's causation, where one event causes the other. So, OK. Well, what's an example that helps highlight the difference between correlation versus causation? And if you can find a nice graph that illustrates this, that's great. I looked briefly. I didn't see something that it was exactly to my liking. But my guess is that the number of hours spent watching TV would correlate with correlate positively with your weight. Because if you spend a lot of hours watching TV, that you might weigh more. Now, that would be a correlation. But is it necessarily a causation? Does watching TV cause you to gain weight? Not directly, no. Well said, perfect, thanks Don. Not directly. So my dad used to teach nutrition here at OCC. And what he would say is that, well, what causes you to gain weight is simple. It's taking in more calories than you burn. That's it. So if you're watching TV, that doesn't necessarily mean that that's true, but it does make it easier for that to happen. You're not out walking around, burning calories, exercising, et cetera. You're just sitting. And if you polish off a quarter of Ben and Jerry's while you're sitting, it's a lot easier to take in more calories than you burn. So you gain weight. But one doesn't necessarily cause the other, okay? So trying to see a, a difference in correlation versus causation. And that's something that you need to be aware of as you tackle the homework. Now, sometimes in this great world of data, there's some strange correlations, things that you wouldn't expect to be related. I mean, I can understand how these might be related, but how about some other things? Let's take a look at a few of those. Mm.
Now let's take a look at this plot. It looks like these two curves, and I'm not even looking at what they represent, but doesn't it look like they rise and fall together? I mean, they look like they're going pretty much in lockstep, you know, up and down together. Well, let's step back for a moment and look not just at the points, but what this represents. When you've got the total revenue generated by arcades and how many computer science doctorates, PhDs were awarded in the US. And wow, they look pretty similar, but I don't necessarily think one is going to drive the other. Maybe, I, I don't know, it just seems kind of strange. So this is an example of something called a spurious correlation. Yeah, they're correlated, but there's no reason that they should be. It's just going to happen when you work in a world of data. Let's take a look at a different one. How about the divorce rate in Maine and the per capita consumption of margarine? So should we all be eating more margarine uh, to help drive down the divorce rate in Maine? Does that make sense? Not even a little bit. Yeah, thanks, John. Yeah, not even a little bit. All right, so they happen to be correlated, but there's no reason that they should be. Okay, um, it's just not. For a long time, and I don't know if it's still true or not, but there was an interesting economic correlation, or at least a correlation to the stock market, whereas the team that won the Super Bowl would help predict the future of the stock market. That is, if the NFC team won, then it was gonna be a good year for the stock market. And that, that actually held for a long time. I, I think it's fallen off in recent years, but it was true for quite a long time that that was a reasonable predictor of the stock market future. Yet there's just no reason to believe that it's an actual true predictor. It's just a, a correlation, a spurious correlation. Okay. So let's play around with trying to get some data into StatDisk. And give me a second to open up some data for us here. When you see this kind of a problem and you realize, oh, I'm gonna have to work with some data, look for this little icon, because that's gonna allow you to open something up and copy it to a clipboard or perhaps you can open it in Excel. But I'm gonna open up here. Now I gotta admit that my students earlier had a lot of problems getting this copied into some of their data. So one of the things you might try would be open it in an Excel sheet. And that might be a quick way to do something like that. So I'll open it up here. It should give me two columns of data, one that represents tar and one that represents carbon dioxide carbon monoxide, I should say. And I'm gonna copy it and paste it into, uh, how come it's doing that to me? I'm gonna copy this and paste it into the chat. And like I said, we had some problems with people being able to copy that earlier. If you wanted to open up your homework and try and copy it yourself directly from the uh, homework into your own buffer and then paste it into status, that's fine as well. But give me some feedback if you're able to get this pasted into StatDisk. Now to find your data and edit it, you wanna click StatDisk. So in the upper left-hand corner, click StatDisk. And then if you've got some data there that you're all done with, you can click the clear button, get rid of that stuff. Then select okay. And now we can paste that into our sample editor. So 
So I'll pause here for a second, let you catch up. Remember you need to click the stat disk online in the upper left-hand corner to get back to your sample editor and then paste your data into this. If you have some data there that you need to get rid of, you can hit the clear key. Now I'll give you a heads up, stat disk isn't gonna like this. Let's see it and understand why. If we were gonna do a scatter plot of this data, then we're gonna to wanna to go to the menu that says data, and then down to scatter plot. I'll select columns one and two respectively. And I'll just let it have that generic title of scatter plot. I'm not gonna play with any of that stuff. When you're ready, press plot and it's gonna bark at you. It's gonna say, wait a minute, columns must contain, must not contain any blank or non-numeric cells. So what it's complaining about is the title of those columns, the tar and the carbon monoxide. So we're gonna to have to get rid of that. Um, I just have a question. So I like was able to like copy the data and then clear all the other stuff. But when I pasted it, it's all going into like the column one, one. column. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a problem that I've run into a number of times. So the one thing that you could do would be open it in Excel and then uh -huh. copy it from Excel. That might work a little bit better. And in fact, an opening in Excel if you have it here, then I would suggest that you copy just this part of it and skip the tar and the carbon monoxide titles at the top, because that's the issue that we're getting from StatDisk as to why this isn't working. So um, I have a question. Aren't yeah. we able to just make the scatter, scatter plot on Excel? Yeah, you can, you can. Yeah, it's just easier to just do it that way, in my opinion. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, I think this is your first day. Um, we've, we've gone over Google Sheets. That's what I've used to, to plot these things. And it's easy to plot it in Google Sheets as well to get a scatter plot there. But eventually we're gonna be using StatDisk more and more just because it's so convenient. And now I'm gonna stick with using StatDisk here. You could do this on a TI-84 graphing calculator as well. The problem with all of those things is just getting the data in. And that's especially a pain if you're working with a graphing calculator, which is why I'm not spending the time to show that here, but it does have those capabilities. So to your question for that, I mean, could you do a plot there in Excel? Sure. Google Sheets? Sure. I just happen to be showing it here. So the problem that we run into is that we've got this data which isn't numerical. We got to get that tar and that CO. And my workaround was quite simple. I'm just like, okay, I'm gonna delete this value here, 11, and put it up here, 11. And I'll do the same thing for the carbon monoxide. I'll change the 11 down there, bring it up here. And now I've got the same data set it's got a little different order than it did before, but that doesn't really matter. It's still gonna be the same X, Y points. You know what? I deleted some a value here somehow. I don't know how I did that. All right, I'm gonna clear this all out before I plot this again. And let me just copy that and paste it one more time. There. Could you just take out the titles? I yeah. can just leave the data and then put it on like columns. Yep. Okay. So what I did when I just copied this now was I left out the, the top two uh, names, just left out the column names. Go to data, scatter plot, column one, and column two. Let's call this tar versus CO, tar on the x-axis, carbon 
an oxide on the y-axis. Uh, let's see. I'm going to unclick show regression line. And that's the plot that I get. Are you guys getting something similar? Yeah. Thanks, Josh. Yeah. OK, good. If you had to guess, what kind of correlation would you guess we would get from this? What value of R? Point nine. Yeah, point nine sounds pretty good. Yeah, something close to one, but not quite one. So point nine sounds perfect. Thank you. All right, how are we doing on getting this graphed? Because certainly graphing it one way or another is going to be what you're going to need to be able to do for this homework set. Do you think it make a big difference if I switch these? If I said, all right, I'm going to graph column one as y, column two as x. It's going to make a big difference. No, not really. Still looks like it has about a 0.9 for its linear correlation coefficient. That's okay. It just kind of depends on what you think is the predictor and what is the dependent variable. So I think it seems to me that the amount of tar that you have in a cigarette would predict how much carbon monoxide you get out of it. That's what it seems like to me. So it seems like it makes sense to have the grams of tar on the x-axis and the grams of carbon monoxide on the y-axis. So like I said, it's going to depend on what you think is the predictor and what's the dependent variable or the independent variable and the dependent variable. Are you comfortable getting this data in here? Because that's the big sticking point that you're going to run into with your homework here. Yeah, it's, it seems All pretty right. solid there. All right. Uh, mm, let me just take a look back here at my notes. I think we're looking pretty good here. It'll be later on in the course that we'll actually do the calculations of these linear correlation coefficients. And we'll go a lot more. We'll be able to address Sam's concern here that, you know what, there, there's something going on here, but yeah, our linear correlation coefficient isn't telling us enough about what's going on here. It's just gonna give us a zero. So we're gonna improve upon that for different sets of data. <sighs> Okay, I think that's about it for section 2.4. So let me stop things here.